good morning to you. So here's what happened. Uh, I was going to come turkey hunt today and then do some stuff to help the landowner on his land after I got done hunting for a couple hours. And it's it's about an hour, a little over an hour and a half. Well, right at an hour and a half for me to get to this property from my house. So got up about four, headed this direction and got three quarters of the way here and realized I left my turkey vest. Brought my camouflage, brought my gun, but the turkey vest has the calls and the shotgun shells in it. So I'm gonna go out into the woods anyway, right? Um, and, and it struck me that, it, although I wanted to go turkey hunting today, I've only had a couple opportunities that actually worked out this year. But um, I'm a woodsman, and so I can go turkey hunting or I can do other things out here. And so there's no disappointment really, other than I wanted to get a turkey because I like turkey meat. But what I thought I'd do is I thought I'd turn this into a positive for you all as well, because it's definitely going to be a positive for me and find, I don't know, 10 things that jump out at me in the woods here today and share them with you. All right, so the first one I want to talk about is rhythm. There's a rhythm to a lot of different things, and maybe I'll point out two or three different ones, but the first one is the rhythm of raindrops falling. Uh, when rain has happened in an environment like this, then it'll definitely, even in the mornings when it hasn't rained, it'll sound like it's raining when you're out in the forest. But the key to understand the difference is to listen closely to the rhythm of how they're falling. The rhythm of raindrops that are just due or rain that has happened the night previously is very different from the rhythm of the rain that's happening while it's actually raining. I know that's a very obvious point, but I've had students that are new to the outdoors will come out here and go, why is it raining here, but it's not outside in the open? And it's an interesting thing to kind of note the difference between the rhythm of rainfall from dew and leftover rain versus when rain is actually falling. If you'll listen real closely at a time like this, this is springtime where the leaves are out, then you'll hear a very different sound above you in the canopy versus what you hear down here. And so it takes a pretty discerning ear to be able to hear, oh man, there's a lot of raindrops hitting up there in the canopy versus the ones that are down here lower. So pay attention, you'll pick it up. So number two, and this was just happening, but as soon as I started talking, uh, it stopped. But listen to the rhythm of bird song. So John Young did a what I would consider a very pioneering work for those of us that are new to the outdoors. And this includes me as it relates to bird song. And paying attention to when birds have feeding calls, when they have mating calls, when they have uh, danger calls, basically. And there's a lot more to it and just so much so much to it it's hard for me to grasp and understand it all but one thing that kind of stands out to me in the information is that you'll have a very certain a very rhythmic sound of birds that are just doing their normal morning activities like today it's real early it's just past daylight by about 30 minutes and then when there's an alarm call the pitch will get higher and the and the sound will get faster Instead of, for example, beep, 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 it goes beep, 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 beep. So I just had a, and again, I'm, I'm just terrible at my birds. Uh, I wish I understood specific birds better, but I don't. But I just had a bird that was here that was alarming because it saw me. And when I started talking, it was enough for it to send it on its way. So but it was alarming and as it alarmed, it brought other birds to that sound or at least they paid attention to it. And so um, it's let basically everything in the woods know that something's going on here, even if it didn't know what it was until I started talking. So pay attention to the bird song. That's another way of listening to the rhythm. Now I'll do one more before I, before I get, or one more sitting here and then I'll head out and we'll do some other stuff together. Um, you can't see it, but I'm sitting on a garbage bag right now. Everything out here is really wet because it rained last night. One of the things that I try to get across to people to carry for a survival kit, and really it's just kind of making life more enjoyable out here, kit, 
is a garbage bag. In my second book, Ultimate Wilderness Gear, I had a list of 10 things. I really need to make a, a 10 things that you can use a garbage bag for. I really need to make a video on 101 uses of a garbage bag. I've got 101 uses of a bandana, 101 uses of a paracord, and I need to make 101 uses of a garbage bag and duct tape. Those are two more. So, but anyway, um, on a day like today where I'm going to sit down on the ground and listen to bird song and watch animals and study them, uh, maybe I, I, I brought my sketchbook to take some sketches. I'll probably sit down on the ground to sketch something out. Then um, this garbage bag is going to be really useful for me to keep my butt from getting wet. Um, there's nothing wrong with uh, you being more comfortable in the outdoors if that helps you to spend time out here. There's times where I lay out here and I'm soaking wet and hot and sweaty and stinky and, and stuff like that. But there's a lot of other times where I don't want my butt to be wet because it's uncomfortable. And if I can avoid that, I will. So take a garbage bag with you. It'll help. Hey, I will do one more while I'm sitting here. Uh, so I, I've gotten in the habit in the last month or so of carrying on trips like this, because I do this pretty regular, the Minuteman bag from Yellow Birch Outfitters. Yellow Birch Outfitters. It's a great bag. I think I did a video on this earlier, but let me show you some things that I carry every time I do stuff like this. So I've got the Identifying Kentucky's Forest Trees this book comes from the University of Kentucky. It's a great book. Um, the Tree Finder book that comes from, um, I can't remember what the publisher is, but Nature Study Guide Publishing. Um, Patrick Allen, one of the alumni of Nature Reliance School, he had a one of those little nature guide books for tracking, and I looked at it, man, it's it's first time I'd seen it. It's a, actually a really good little tracker guide. I've got one of these all-weather notepads for notes. Um, I actually have this guy that Jay made me and he actually made this leather with a Nature Reliance School embossed leather case. Uh, I, this thing, this notebook is full. And then I've got a bigger sketch pad too for, for notes. This is what I usually take to business meetings, but I also use this to draw bigger plants and stuff at times too. But this bag, um, here's how I use this bag. Oh, another thing that I keep in here. This is really useful, especially for somebody like me. You might be the same way. I keep one of these dudes in there. It's a little magnifier. It actually has a light that's about dead on it. But if I'm looking at leaves or I'm looking at a splinter in my finger or I'm looking at the details of a track, then sometimes my 53 year old eyes need something like this to help. So I keep that in there anymore. Uh, and again, it usually has a light on it. You can barely see it. It's a, almost gone. But man, these things are really useful. So I'm gonna turn the camera around for this next one, but I wanna tell you about it. So the uh, nature immersion class we had last week, Eric calmly taught half a class. I taught half a class. And um, he was talking about herbaceous plants, green stem plants. And one of the things that I'm not really good at, at all, <clears throat> really good at, at all is identifying ferns. And so he showed us a couple. I'm going to show you one and how he taught me to identify it. So this is Christmas fern. And let me pull off one of these leaves. This, this is a leaf right here, the whole thing. And this is a leaflet. Let me pull one of those off to show you. So see how that has a little... On this side of it has a little tip to it. Sorry, I'm trying to get that in camera. Imagine, if you will, that that is a boot. And that is Santa Claus's boot. So this is Christmas fern. This is the one that you'll see oftentimes a lot of people call fiddlehead ferns. And are edible when they're fiddleheads, when they're rolled up in the mornings. Uh, I find them to be incredibly bitter. They don't have a whole lot of nutritional value, so I, for the most part, avoid them. So for this next one, you're going to have to look back over behind me. You'll see right there a root ball. There's one really close right here. There's another one down there. Where is it? Yeah, right in there. 
and it's kind of hard to see, but there's a bunch right here. So this, there's a great book called Forest Forensics out there, and I can't remember the author's name. And he shares in that book ways to, to basically age an area based upon uh, a lot of different things. But one of them was what he calls pillows. Pillows being the root balls that I just pointed out to you. So you can imagine, if you will, for a place like this here in Kentucky, uh, this is getting close to eastern Kentucky. That, it, it, and this is really hard to to uh, to take in. All those trees that you see right there, a hundred years ago, so were not there. Okay, it's almost impossible to age trees by looking at them. But you can judge an area based upon what you know from history. And uh, these trees were removed and large scale agriculture operations were done in areas like this. So uh, there might be cattle here, there might be crops like tobacco or hemp back in the day that would have been grown here. But one of the things that you can see in a forest are a lot of pillows. So think about this, if a forest, if a lot of trees fall in a forest and then they're removed because you're gonna create a a field, then those pillows are knocked down. Uh, in a place like this where you see a lot of pillows and you can see that on the other side of the pillow where the tree was when it fell, if it's not harvested for logging practice or firewood or something of that nature, you can see that trees like this one right here is, is decaying, but it's still there. You'll find pillows like that out in a, well, here's a good example right here as I walk by it. There's a pillow right here and it extends all the way down through there. Oops, all the way down through there. And it basically looks like the rest of the forest floor because it is decomposed so much that the herbaceous and even woody stem plants now are growing on top of the dead tree because it's turning back into, to eventually turn back into soil and earth, right? But if you see a lot of pillows like that, then that area was probably not used as agricultural practice. It was, um, it has been forced as probably logged at some point in time, but a lot of those pillows indicate that it wasn't flattened out by cattle or uh, for other crop growth or something of that nature. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard for me to explain because I'm not adept at it, at describing it. But uh, look for those pillows. It'll give you a lot of indicators it's kind of like tracking 100 years ago trying to pick up 100 year old tracks or 150 year old tracks or something of that nature another one that'll happen uh, sam bulig and i ran into this one the other day where we cut a tree down on some property at his church and there was this very unique growth pattern in it and the more i looked at it, i thought what is that i mean it was just it was it had become part of the wood well it was an old piece of uh a barbed wire or fencing that it deteriorated and there it is there really wasn't any of the fence left other than the wood had been discolored so you can find that and firewood and stuff along old ways and old places and help age a forest as well so behind me you'll see a little beech tree there american beech and basically what you have there is where the landowner here has cleared trees out away from the road to make it easy for um, trackers and trucks and stuff like that to pass through. Just listen, I thought I heard something odd. But um, you'll notice back there that there's, you know, 20 branches growing off of it. So the root system is there and the root system is going to continue to be there and is going to push energy up through the cambium layer of the tree and the branches that are at the bottom will continue to grow. Now, a tree like a beech is what we like to refer to as a shade tolerant tree, which means it doesn't need a whole lot of sunlight. It'll do okay down here under forest canopy. That's why you see a forest like this with lots and lots and lots and lots of beech trees in it, which can be 
not the best tree in the world for a forest, put it that way. Uh, for wildlife, you know, if they have beech nuts a lot, then you'll see that and it'll uh, be a useful nut tree or fruit for for wildlife. But um, that's what's going on there. And that tree might actually survive like that and start all over. But anytime you cut a tree in any way, shape or form, you're in essence opening a wound on it, just like you're opening a wound on you. And so disease and rot is likely to get into that tree and cause it to die compared to uh, a tree that's got real healthy bark on it like this one over here or something of that nature. So I've got a, another one, I'll turn the camera around because it's hard to see. Let's see if I can do this. So there's several trees here and I don't think it's picking it up. But here's what's also here. Another way to help identify trees is to notice when flowers, flower petals fall off. So there's a couple things going on here. This is a flowering dogwood. But as I'm going back through here, I see where the landowner has been back here mowing. And so as I look, here's some things that you'll note for tracking. And you'll see on top of those right there, there's a lot of dirt and mud on top of them. In the center, you don't see that. Over here in the path where the tractor is, there is a lot of mud and dirt on top of the blooms. So that tells you a couple of things. The first is that at least most of those blooms fell before the landowner came through here on his mower. The other one is that if you happen to have known the approximate time when those blooms fell, then you could determine, hey, those blooms probably fell a week ago, the landowner was here after that. Or if you see the tracks underneath the blooms, for example, then you'll know if they had fallen a week ago, the landowner had been here a week ago. And so utilizing transfer, is what we call transfer, where the mud is on top of the blooms, where a medium has transferred from one area on top of something else is a good way of helping to term, determine, number one, direction of travel, and number two, um, uh, aging, what we call aging. Aging is one of those things that really gets prominent exposure in pop culture, Hollywood, movies, and stuff like that. And it's, quite frankly, from my perspective, one of the hardest things to do in tracking, but also uh, it's, it's very, it's very hard to get specific and detailed with aging in your typical track line. So it's kind of one of those things where Hollywood's way off. So I got another one for you. I think I can hold the camera like this. So last week we did a tree ID course as part of nature immersion. And I usually leave that. Um, I can do a fairly decent job at an introductory course on tree identification. But one of the things, again, um, just trying to bring up Eric Comley, because he's been so good to me and taught me so much. We had this tree that we were having trouble identifying because it's just, well, for a lot of reasons, come to class and we'll teach you why this one's hard to identify. But as we got to the end of it, one of the things that you can do and let me say this before I do this, I'm pulling one leaf off as I walk, is um, we basically dwindled it down to a couple different species. There's a lot of value in learning how to use a dichotomous key. And a dichotomous key is basically a, a diagram, if you will, if you want to visualize it, where you choose, okay, does the tree have alternating buds or opposite buds? And then if it's alternating, you go to these species. If it's opposite, you go to these species. And then you take that on down until you come up with a certain species of tree. Plants, you can do the same thing. Um, well, nearly everything out here, you can use a dichotomous key to, to identify it. But with that said, um, 
sometimes it's difficult. I was having difficulty with that tree as were a few others. Um, Eric had a little difficulty doing it. And then his last, uh, last test was to take a leaf, put it back next to your mowers, chew it up, is it sour? And that, <laughs> it's sour. Now, I say that with caution because you don't want to go around doing that with just any leaf. We had dwindled it, ooh, that's sour. Dwindled it down to a couple of species, both of them, that, both of them we know that were not harmful to, to take in. By chewing that up, you find that it's sour, and it is, you might have guessed, sour wood. So, um, I need to, that's one I actually need to sketch. And let me talk about sketching. Because it's easy to just look at something or take a picture of something and miss a tremendous amount of details. But when you take the time and effort to sketch something, then it's going to have a whole lot more, um, it's going to, the plan is going to present, well, the plan is what it's, it is, but it's going to give you an opportunity to see a lot more important details and sketch them as you sketch them because you're looking at it, you're seeing lentil cells, you'll see in, it is alternate or it is opposite. You'll see that the veination is alternate or opposite. You'll see that there's little hairs on the outside of the leaf or on the stem or whatever it might be. These are things you'll notice as you're sketching that you might not notice if you just snap a quick photo or just look at it. So this is one of those safety things that's worth your investment and time in identifying plants. You'll see right here, there's a long line of daffodils. Actually in the springtime, they're already gone to bloom and drop blooms, but this whole field is covered in them. Um, daffodils were one of those things that homesteaders and, and uh, well, homesteaders would plant and then um, they just, they just go crazy and go nearly everywhere. The reason I point that out is that it's cool. You might see them out in the middle of a forest, which is interesting. So um, you, you might see that. But the reason I wanted to point it out today is that because you can just so easily see right here, there's an old chimney. And these rocks right here are surrounding an old well. So for example, the other day we had a class out here we had small kids and it would be easy for the kids to want to come around and explore and whatnot and we encourage that but if you're out in the forest and your kids are doing exploration and stuff like that and you see piles of rocks all of a sudden that are just hmm, they don't seem like that's right or you see a lot of daffodils it might be an old homestead there might be an old well there's an old well right there, has rocks on top of it. That uh, that well's a good that well's a good 12, 14 feet deep. So that would be very problematic for anybody to fall into, but especially a child and the panic that would ensue. So uh, worth your attention because nearly all the forest in a place like here in Kentucky at some point in time had people living in them and wells dug and stuff of that nature and so you'll find those things all over the place out in the middle of a a, uh, a well-established forest even so keep your eyes open for that sort of thing so tracy tremble and myself tracy did all the homework for a podcast on lightning that you need to check out. I can't remember the number. Just look it up. Lightning Nature Reliance Media Podcast. A lot of good data there. The reason I'm bringing that up is because I just heard thunder. And I'm on one of the higher points of this property. That's not a good place to be to avoid lightning. So that's why I'm walking downhill to get away from some of that. And I'm actually going to go down here and get under a rock shelter. Because it looks like it's getting ready to storm fairly well. Um, benefit of of uh, having a piece of property like this, right, where you can get under a rock shelter and get completely out of the rain. But if you didn't have that luxury, then uh, getting out or getting, well, in the areas that you travel, know where the coniferous trees are. You're 
hemlocks, your pines, your, depending upon what part of the world you're in, your spruce maybe. And uh, because those are gonna shed water and they're gonna shed water really well and they're gonna shed water throughout the year. And so if you know where those are in your normal areas that you like to do things, then um, you can get out of the weather in a situation like I'm getting ready to experience. Now, going back to what I said earlier, because I'm listening to it and I'm hearing it now, I doubt you all can hear it, but I can hear that the raindrop rhythm has drastically changed, even though I'm out here in the woods. So listening closely, I can hear that it's hitting the canopy tops as well. So now it is raining, even though it sounds like it's raining, it's been raining all morning and it hasn't been. And so hearing the thunder, obviously, uh, hearing the rain pitter patter uh, rhythm increase tells me I either need to get my rain gear out or I need to find shelter of some sort. So beautiful thing for me is we have these rock shelters right here. And then I've also got all these hemlock trees here that I can squirrel away in for a little while. So that's what I'm gonna go do. So now that's not the camera that's fogged up. It's actually the fog rolling in behind me. God, isn't that gorgeous back there? That fog rolling in. Um, the thing that jumped out at me here is you'll see things like this a lot. See where something's dug into that tree. More than likely looking for insects. I get a lot of people that send me pictures like this and go, um, hey, there's a bear here. Let me show you why. I don't think this is a bear. If you look real closely, you'll see a hole right there. Now, if that was a bear, you'd see multiple claw marks. Okay. You might see another hole there and another hole there, but there's not any, I don't know if you can tell this from this camera shot, but there's no um, order to that if it were claw marks like a bear that's some sort of bird that is digging in there and pulling stuff out a lot of times i'll see woodpeckers that go to the ground and do this woodpeckers will go to the ground and do that and uh tear it apart and it looks like pretty sizable here's another one right here this is a, another perfect example look at this one right here So more than likely a bird has dug into there. That could be any number of things that close to the ground, but anyway, not always a bear. So one of the reasons that I wanted to come to these open fields today for turkey hunting, even though I'm not turkey hunting, but turkey observation, and this will help you all that are new to turkey hunting. You, you uh, veteran hunters already know this, but turkeys fly, but they have a really difficult time just being on the ground and just boop, taking off. It's a big bird, you all. It takes a lot of effort. And so oftentimes they'll run to get speed and to get going up into the air. Okay, so think about being Mr. Turkey and you've been out here all night and it's been raining on you and you're soaking wet. You're even heavier now and your feathers are not going to be incredibly aerodynamic as they were because they're wet. And so you'll often see turkeys in a field when it's raining because they can get such a big runway to get up and off the ground and they can easily get away from prey. So you'll often see after a rain, turkeys coming down off the roost and into a field because they'll feel safer there because they can get away from predators. Okay, that was interesting. I was getting ready to take a video and this would be the last one. Beautiful dogwood blooms. I 
And right as I stepped into the edge of the woods here, I jumped a bunch of baby turkeys. Kind of wild, they're already born. I've seen eggs. I've seen a destroyed nest. And I've seen baby turkeys all within three days together. So, they need to get back together because they're young, they don't want to do it. So, if I flush something like that, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out of here. They have their own ways of getting back together, communication with mama. So, I'm going to leave them be so they feel secure enough to do that. So for those of you who stayed the whole time, I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. And thanks for joining me on these woods walks. I don't do them very often. I'm putting most of all my educational content, informative content into uh, the NRS membership moving forward and not as much on social media. I'll never give up on social media in whatever form it presents itself to us, but I've got to take the steps necessary to, to make sure I help the people that really want to see us. And right now, social media is making that very, very difficult. Oh, last one. Just because I just saw it. Let me turn the camera around again. That's just my foot as a side reference, a size reference. Animal scat, as you might expect, because you've experienced this yourself with your own poop, is uh, very dependent upon the food that you take in and that they take in. In the springtime, where a deer is taking in a lot of herbaceous plants, a lot of green plants with a lot of chlorophyll, right? Then their poo will be a lot more runny and will look like that rather than the pellets that everybody knows is deer poop. So I get pictures of that a lot. What is this? It's got to be a bear because it's something they don't see as often. And I understand why they're asking the question that way, but that's, that's deer poo. So signing off you all. I hope you've learned something. I hope it's been helpful. My goal is always to be of service to people. And, uh, let me know in the comments what kind of things you'd like to learn. When I have time, I'll put stuff on social media. Otherwise, jump into the NRS membership. It's like nine bucks a year, you all. I mean, nine bucks a month. 90, I think $99 a year. Come on. If you appreciate the things that I share, then consider joining. And if you do, I greatly appreciate you for it because it definitely helps us keep doing what we're doing.